Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance and forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for your word in Scripture. We thank you for meeting us here this morning, even for waiting for us to arrive so that we could sing to you, so that we could speak about you and celebrate you. We recognize this morning that we are not the only location of worship. Not only is our globe covered in churches singing, but the creation itself sings to you in worship. So we join together with all the human voices around the world currently and throughout all of time as the church, and we join together with your creation itself, and we say, you are great. We love you. Receive glory from us this morning. As we begin begin to speak and communicate, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would grease the wheels. Help me to proclaim as you want me to proclaim and help us to hear as you want us to hear and help us to remember in the way that you want us to remember. Transform us this morning. We love you. Amen. You may be seated. As I mentioned, we are opening the book of Mark. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So good to be with you, tan. I am tan now. Florida is warm. We loved it, but it's good to be back, and I have a couple of things I want to say about my vacation. First of all, Sean, thank you for your leadership here. did a great job uh, in my absence. It's fun to be able to leave and not miss a beat. Good job. Second, um, there's been a process in in my mind. I I just want to, sometimes I just have vulnerable conversations with you guys, and I just kind of tell you what's in my heart and mind, and I try to kind of wipe away some of the formality of this moment and just show you who I am. And I want to let you know um, that before becoming your pastor, I was just a preacher. And I just would come in and I would preach a sermon and I would leave and the pastor would have to clean that up. (laughs) And I just got to say whatever I wanted to say. And um, I became very comfortable with that and I liked that. And uh, here I'm... I'm realizing that there is a process of engagement that's happening where over the course of a year, I'm looking to see how does that preaching style interact with a group of people over a long period of time. This morning in uh, prayer with the leaders beforehand, uh, Deb Pence was praying and said, some people need meat, some people need milk. Lord, we'll let you sort that out. And that's what I'd like to say to you. I know that I am a meat and potatoes kind of guy. And sometimes there's an awful lot of meat, and sometimes you got to cook the meat. 
And I know sometimes we come in and we want a little bit of milk in that meat. I'm going to let the Lord sort that out. I preach with conviction. I preach with passion. And I want to give us meat and potatoes. But on vacation, as Jade and I had 18 hours to talk to each other on the way back. <laughs> We came to a kind of a conclusion, which was very simple, and that was to write on a note card, and I have it on a sticky note on my computer, yes, and it just says, with a dash of Mr. Rogers, yeah. and that's going to be my goal. Yeah. I know that I can come across pretty hardcore, pretty intense, pretty passionate, almost scary sometimes. My goal for the next year is to add a dash of Mr. Rogers. Yes. Great. And so you're welcome to hold me accountable. <laughs> now let's get in the Word of God. <laughs> Mark chapter 1. And the first statement I want to make is that Mark begins in Acts. Mark begins in Acts. So can you turn with me to the book of Acts? Chapter 1, verse 1. That's where the book of Mark begins. I'm going to explain this. I want you to just stick with me here for a minute because we're actually going to study maybe from a different angle Bible study that you may not have thought about it this way before, but I just want to introduce something to you that I believe if you can stick with me and, and try to see things, I'm going to, I'm going to hit it from def, different perspectives even this morning to make sure that you get it. Uh, but I believe if you can hang with me and see what I'm saying, it will bring new colors and vibrancy to Bible study, even places that you've been many times. So Mark begins in Acts. Look at Acts 1, verse 1. Now let me remind you, Matthew, Mark, L Luke, and John are four Gospels of many, many Gospels. These are the four that were canonized. They were the four that were included here. So many people wrote down the story. Four of them were included in Scripture, and that's what Luke is referring to here. By the way, Acts is written by Luke. Sometimes it's called Luke-Acts as a combined book. So if you stop at the end of the book of Luke and then read Acts 1-1, you're reading something that's designed to go together. Uh, the ascension of Christ is actually an overlapping point in there. So, 1-1. One, one. In my former book, Theophilus, he's referring to the Gospel of Luke, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach. That's all I wanted to read to you there. That's, he's just saying, in the last book, I told you the good news. Everything that Jesus did and taught. Now, move down to verse 12. Then, that's all I wanted to read to you out of that. <laughs> what he's saying is, in the last book this happened, and I told you everything that Jesus did, and I told you the life that he lived, and then you see there in between verses 1 and 12 is a story of the ascension. But he already told the ascension at the end of the book of Luke. He's just overlapping, kind of like two train cars are connected together. And then he uses the word, then which is supposed to tell you, here's all the book of Luke, and then after the book of Luke, here's what happened after that. The reason that I'm telling you this is that Acts is a genre of its own. It's a kind of New Testament history book. It's a church history book. It just tells the story of what happened. So throughout the book of Acts, there's, there's missionary journeys, there's church planting, there's uh, discussions, deep discussions about how to interpret and understand and apply some of the things. See, in one one it says, Jesus told us all this, but then they get into the real application struggle, which is, well, how do we do that, though? Do we hold the Gentiles to the same standards that we were supposed to be living to? Now, let's do th these three and leave the rest out. See, that's all through the book of Acts, just trying to figure out how do we do church. It's important as you study Scripture that you see it in levels, that it was a real historical timeline and event. Things really happened. And what is written, when it is written, was not at the same time that it was happening. 
So when you read here that it says, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times and dates. Well, he did say that, but this was written down later. Things have happened since this happened. One of the more interesting books that I've read, which is appropriate for today, is this one, 1776. It's a good July 4th book, isn't it? Now, this illustrates my point quite clearly. Tell me if you know what this is from. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with one another. Anybody know what that's from? Let me read it in a more... There it is. When in the course of human events... That helps probably. That was written on July 2nd, 1776. Now I want you to, in your mind, imagine that picture. You have these people sitting there, and they have this whole history and this dynamic interaction between them and the other colonial people and the king and who's doing what and where are we going to go and how are we going to respond to this and they come to the conclusion to write this down and that happened on July 2nd 1776 now let me read something else in congress July 4th 1776 a declaration by the representatives of the United States of America in general Congress assembled. That was the introduction to the publication of the Declaration of Independence in the Pennsylvania Evening Post on Saturday, July 6, 1776, two days later. So imagine someone getting their newspaper and they sit there and they read this. They're reading the thing that we just read but they're reading it later. Things have happened. And they know when they read it that they are reading a narrative, an explanation of something that happened in history. So they are trying then to reach back and understand in what way does this apply to me? Now, imagine that very same person holding on to that newspaper and reading it after the war is over. You see, when you read it the first time, you think, oh my word, are we really going to defy the throne? We're going to go to war. I might have to fight. I might lose my friends over this. And so you feel all kinds of feelings reading that newspaper. But then later, if you read it after the war, you're reading the very same document with very different feelings. Now here we have a book. It says right here on page 135, in Philadelphia, the same day as the British landing on Staten Island, July 2nd, 1776, the Continental Congress, in a momentous decision, voted to dissolve the connection with Great Britain. Another description of the exact same thing. But this description was written in 2005 to you. But you know that, don't you? Because you understand that when you buy this book from Barnes & Noble and you pick it up and you see the way it's printed, you know that you're not reading something from back in history, you're reading a current narrative designed for you to tell you an old story. And so here you see there are three different ways in this book that are all common to us. You know all of these, that when you read the same exact story, you have to understand when was it written, for who was it written, and for what purpose was it written. And that changes the way that you understand it. Now, what about Mark? Skip forward to Acts 10, because Acts 10 is actually the first gospel. 
Acts 10, verse 34. This is the first gospel. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ to his Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. No one had done that before. Until Peter said that, and until Luke heard him and wrote it down, there was no written story of anything that Jesus had done. It was only oratory, just telling stories. That right there, Acts 10, is the first gospel. It was the idea for gospel. So I want you to try and pull yourself out of what you know here in your scripture, using some of the information and imagine not this book, not the book that you think is written just for you right now, but go back in time to the actual events. Historically, what happened is Jesus was born, lived 30 years, he was baptized, he ministered for three years, he was crucified, he appeared to his apostles, he ascended. After he ascended, they gathered together, and the Holy Spirit fell on them. When the Holy Spirit fell on them, they began to speak and preach. Persecution broke out because of how they were behaving. They were unsettling. And when they were unsettling, people attacked them. The persecution scattered them. When they scattered, they began telling everyone else in different places the same good news Hadn't written it down yet. They scattered. When they told other people the good news, those people believed, and that's how the church began. After the church began, they began writing the Bible. That's when this begins. And so Mark begins in Acts. Are you with me? You read Mark like it begins with Jesus it doesn't. It begins with the church who's trying to develop but needs to read about Jesus. So he remembers back for them and begins at the beginning of the story, which is what he said. So the church has scattered. Everyone is in Rome. If you look at the end of Acts, it says in Acts 21 through 28, there's this story of Paul going to Rome through a series of trials. He's getting in trouble. He ends up in Rome. In Acts 28, 16, you can go there if you want to, but you don't have to. In Acts 28, 16, Luke writes, we were in Rome, which means Luke is in Rome as well. Over the course, if you look in different areas, you will find, including in 2 Timothy 4, 11, Paul writes from Rome, confirming that Luke is there and asking for Mark so Paul is in Rome, Luke is in Rome, and Paul writes to Timothy, inviting Timothy and says, bring Mark. So now we know Paul, Timothy, we know from other sources, extra biblical sources, that Peter was there. Paul, Timothy, Paul, Peter, Luke, and Mark are all in Rome. When they are in Rome, Peter and Mark sat down together. And Peter started telling Mark what he knew about Jesus. There was a sense of urgency. Some of you know or have heard some about Nero. Nero was born uh, at two years old. He was orphaned. His mother met Claudius, who was the leader, ruler of the Roman Empire. Claudius fell in love with her, married her. He, she convinced Claudius to love Nero more than his own son. And as soon as Claudius moved the birthright, she killed him, killed Claudius. 
And then Nero, as a young boy, when he realized that his mother's conniving ways were in his way, had her killed. And meanwhile, Paul, Peter, Mark, Luke, and Timothy are all sitting there thinking, whoa, this is the leader of the city we're in and the nation that we're under. A man who would kill his own mother. He killed two wives. And then, nobody knows why, the whole city catches on fire while Nero is gone. And Nero comes back afraid. He's only 16 years old. And so he blames this small group of people called the Christians for setting Rome on fire. And so with that fear, Peter sits down with Mark and says, we need to write down what happened and who Jesus is. Mark 1.1, 1, 1. in the beginning, the beginning of the good news. If you notice, he's saying the beginning of the good news, but then he moves on to a prophecy. So he's going to tell you about Jesus Christ, but then he goes hundreds of years backwards. What he's saying is the beginning has already begun. Jesus has been prophesied. That's the big point. That's what they want to know. He, Jesus Christ cannot be the Messiah. He can't be the Christ. He can't save you unless he's the one who was prophesied. And so that's why he begins this way. The beginning was begun long ago. Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy. And he is intentionally sounding like Genesis. In the beginning. This is the beginning of the good news. It's Mark's way of saying it's a new fresh start. Good news is what he writes, also translated gospel, and Mark's use of that phrase, good news, becomes the genre of gospel. It didn't exist before. Mark saw how Peter put a story together in Acts and thought, oh, with Peter, we can make that, let's really tell the whole thing. That would be good news. And other people really liked it, and the concept of a gospel was born. If you notice, this sense of urgency is all throughout Mark, and it's one of the threads I'm going to be coming back to again and again and again. Urgency. If you want to change the name of this book from Mark, you could change it to immediately, because everything in the book happens immediately. Why? Because did I tell you about Nero? And the situation that they're in. When you're under persecution and you think that your body might be turned into a lamppost covered in oil and lit on fire, you don't have time to sit around and dilly-dally with all the frilly things and tell all the extras and all the details. If you look at the other Gospels, how does Matthew start? Matthew starts with a genealogy. Well, Matthew had some time on his hands. Luke starts with an orderly account giving us a beautiful uh, nativity narrative that we love to use at Christmas time. John starts with a celestial poem. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was... Luke, Mark doesn't have time for this. All the other gospel writers, they really took their time finally telling us that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Messiah. That's the big point. When you have an emergency, you don't wait around to tell people who the Savior is. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Verse 1. Cat's out of the bag. That's the point. That's what the people needed to know, and that's what he told them in the first verse. Mark 2, uh, verses 2 and 3. These are the prophecies. As is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight the paths for him. The Jews knew the Old Testament. Mark was rooting the identity of Jesus in Old Testament prophecy. And as is appropriate for the arrival of anyone important... Someone needs to announce. If you've ever been a guest speaker or, uh, in fact, even if you are coming into a place for the first time, someone needs to announce you, don't they? 
oh, let me introduce. That's a way of showing that someone is important. You introduce them. And that's what we see here. In fact, all four Gospels do that. All four Gospels include John the Baptist as the announcer of Jesus Christ. We talk about Matthew, Mark, and Luke being synoptic. That means that they follow a very similar pattern. John kind of does his own thing. Tells the same story, but in the way he wants to tell it. But all four, the synoptics and John, all four of them include John the Baptist. Mark reminds the readers of this messenger and that it's not just a messenger, although verse 4 tells us that John the Baptist appears in the wilderness. He doesn't appear without precedent. He is prophesied. Verses 4 and 5. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing of Jerusalem. Uh, confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. What is that baptism? It's not the same as that one back there. Can't, can't be. It's something else. We'll find out here in a moment that John knows it's something else. John doesn't pretend that he's doing something he actually isn't doing. It does something. And it must do something that's, that's attractive because there's a great crowd that are coming in. But he doesn't pretend it's doing something it's not doing. Readers of Mark might even remember John the Baptist and his ritual attempts to cleanse. I wonder as I read that, do you remember? Do you remember the way that you attempted to cleanse yourself before Jesus? What did you do to wash up when you came to a place in life that you just didn't feel great about yourself? You felt a little dirty, but you wanted to feel clean. And we come up with these ideas of maybe I'll do something good for someone else. Maybe I'll, I'll go and get a fresh start. I'll go for a walk. Maybe it's more significant. What did you do to feel clean? As you will see next week, we've nearly completed the conference table. We did the significant sanding this week, and I went inside, and I had so much gray, powdery sawdust in my hair from just down like this, filled my hair. And I, I, in the sink, I leaned down and I took water and I washed it out and I looked up and there was some speck here. And I got down and I got water and I looked again and I couldn't, wouldn't come out. And I got down and I'm like, why won't it? That's a gray hair. I was trying to wash out a gray hair. We've got 18 hour car yeah, I got a few more gray hairs after that car ride. <laughs> I wonder how much effort we put into making ourselves presentable to one another by washing external things that are coming from internal places. That really, as long as you can't see them, I washed up just fine. And John wasn't all right with that. John knew, I'm washing something, but I'm not washing everything. Verse 6. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. Uh, if you want, just for curiosity, write down 2 Kings 1, 8. That's a reference to clothing of another, it's another prophet reference. Mark is trying to ensure that all of this is rooted in prophecy. And so he describes the clothing of John the Baptist exactly like the clothing of Elijah. His diet is gross. 
It's intended to be from the land, not from the hand. He relies completely on God to provide his food. He is dressed like Elijah. The point, he is wholly dedicated to his purpose. He is not reliant on someone to feed him. He is not reliant on the latest fashions. He is not reliant on his activity being everything that you need. None of these things are a part of his design or purpose. He's wholly dedicated to his purpose. Is there anything weird about you? Is there anything particular to your purpose? What about you is particular to your purpose? It's really easy to blend in, though, isn't it? It is. I have an aunt. Her name is Dorcas. Long ago, she went to California. She converted to orthodoxy. Now, for the last 20-some years, she has lived on an island off the coast of Alaska. I've seen her three or four times. And when I have seen her, she is always dressed exactly the same. Black around here, black over here, black robe comes down. She's weird. She's dressed in a way that's particular to her purpose. And for that reason, I'm jealous of her. I noticed a while back, my, I have an uncle named Tom, and he wears a cross that's about that big, and it's weird. He wears it with everything, everywhere. It's particular to his purpose. And see, those things don't bother me until I stand back and I look at my life and I think, at what angle does someone have to stand before they can finally see something weird about me? How long can someone look and still think, I'm just like everybody else? Too long. Got to be something weird there, something particular. I admire that about John the Baptist and about my aunt. There's got to be something that's just a little off, something that reveals purpose. And if you're proud of your purpose, you want the revelation of your purpose to be in front. When people win a gold medal, they don't tuck it under their shirt, do they? Seven and eight. And this was his message. After me comes one who is comes the one more powerful than I. The straps of whose sandals I am un, I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is John's sermon. A comparison between his popular act. Crowds are coming. He's comparing his popular act with Christ's superiority. And perhaps my favorite words, after me. That's how he begins his sermon. And this was his message. After me, he wastes no time. He doesn't brag on himself. He doesn't build himself up. He immediately points to Jesus. There's nothing inside of him that you see here that is grabbing a hold of what we might think he deserves. Are you driven or are you called? Many are driven. All are called. Let me give you a distinguishing concept here. Drivenness is confidence in an achievement-oriented 
life plan. It can be phrased as, I know what I can do. That kind of confidence. We've been watching the Olympics as a family. Can't wait for them to get started. We're just watching the trials even, and they're fun. But that's drivenness. People that know what they can do, and they have practiced intricate, tiny movements so much that even under stress, when you get one shot, they nail it. That's knowing what you can do and practicing hard and making it work. They are driven people. Listen to it again and think of that. Confidence in an achievement-oriented life plan, which is different from calledness. Calledness is an inner strength of purpose from God. Inner strength of purpose from God. A driven person says, I know what I can do. A called person says, I know what I am to do. I know what I am to do. Do you hear in those words the deep resolve the unshakable, concrete, set, rebar, reinforced purpose. I know what I am to do. You see, drivenness leaves suspect that it will ever be realized. It's hopeful at best. I know what I can do, but maybe it won't happen. But calledness never fails. It's beyond hope. I know what I am to do. By John's example, John the Baptist, we must be transformed by a calling. And notice that John's calling begins in the wilderness. Sometimes we translate wilderness as desert, and then we think of desert as lost, dry place. That's not the intention here. The wilderness is a place of detached purpose gathering. When the Israelites came to the edge and they weren't ready to go in, he sent them back into the wilderness, not to be only lost, but to gather their purpose. Here we are to understand that he appeared in the wilderness and the wilderness is a transformative place. For some of us, we need to find a wilderness in order to find a calling. So I'm going to ask you three questions. Three questions that we are going to gather from John the Baptist regarding calling. Number one, what is your relationship with crowds? Crowds is validation. That's what that represents. So let me ask the question again. What is your relationship with validation? Validation of drivenness is deadly because it has no core. Validation of calledness is measured the weaker your calling, the weaker your identity, and the more vulnerable you are to misguided validation. So say you're a driven person and you're set out to accomplish whatever. I'm just driven to get itself done. And someone comes over here and they see this of what you've done. What do you do as a driven person? I was doing this. Oh, you're clapping. I'll do more of this. And so validation begins to steer us so that the places where we are encouraged in life somehow become the purpose of our life because validation is so important. Are you willing to do something without validation? Meaning that I'm doing this, and this is clapped for, but 
That's cool, but I'm doing this. Driven people need to be deadly afraid of validation. You're not special because you're validated. You're special because you're called. Anyone will validate you, and sometimes, oftentimes, validation is brainless. It's thoughtless. Somebody passes you in a store, says something in past. They've known you for half a second. They validate something, and you're in such desperate, dry need of validation in your life that you soak it up, and it becomes your absolute purpose to get that validation again because it felt so good. And now who cares what your life purpose was? You like the validation and nobody's been encouraging you, so you're steered by validation. Caution, my friends. Be careful. We ask, what is it that you are validating? So that's what we ask of other people. I want to give this to you as a very helpful rebalancing tool. When someone says, good job, pats you on the back, gives you an attaboy, in your mind, you don't need to say it out loud if you don't want to, but in your mind, say back to them, what is it that you're validating? You can accept the encouragement if you need encouragement, but don't let it guide you too much. What is it that you're validating? Let me give you an even better question. Is your validation aligned with my calling? Is your validation aligned with my calling? God called me, designed me, purposed me for this, and you encouraged me for this, and I feel validated over there. Thanks. Love it. Feels great. It's a balm to my soul. Back to work. Is your validation aligned with my calling? When we were in uh, Florida, Jade's uh, family is, they're all fishermen. And I, I've been to Red Lobster. (laughs) What I do know is there's two kinds of fishing. One's got hooks, one's got nets. I don't know if that's the only two. That's two I've seen. I've seen hooks and nets. Jade's dad built, what does he call it? Shark cannon? Rocket launcher. Rocket. Here's what it is. It's a, it's a big PVC pipe with a, a pressured a tube at the end and a valve. And he takes his bait and he freezes it in a smaller PVC pipe. And he figured out that the end was a perfect... Uh, Easter egg cap, and he puts, his, what is it? Chump cannon. That is, <laughs> chump cannon. I'm a chump cannon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Who shoot chump cannons and chum cannons. So he sets this thing up and he shoots that thing way further than you can cast it by hand. The reason that he does that is he is fishing for something specific that you can't catch here. Now, that's a lot different than just going out in a boat and throwing a net over and seeing what you get. Called people fish with a hook. There is a specific purpose in your life. Probably, I'm going to speak to you vulnerably, but you're a big group. Probably, if you have not had enough encouragement in your life, you're fishing with a net. You'll take whatever you can get. And I just want to say to you, be careful. Because sometimes you'll get stuff in that net that you need to throw back in. Just because you caught it doesn't mean you should eat it. When someone validates something in your life, called people, measure it. What are you validating in me? Maybe it's just cool. Maybe it's called. That's number one. 
And John didn't fall into that. Number two, are you growing in integrity? He wore these clothes and diet, and he did it all in public. By integrity, I mean that he doesn't allow for any portion of his life to look different than his calling. He's not sometimes called. He's always called and even wears and eats that way, and everybody knew it. Are you growing in integrity? This is a, a word I want to introduce. Maybe you're aware of it. It is accommodation. Accommodation is the act of warm participation in someone else's life. You need to be accommodating. Engagement is accommodating. And what that means is, I don't necessarily know a lot about what you're talking about, but because you're talking about it, I want to talk about it. I care about what you care about. That's accommodating. We sometimes have a tendency to guide conversations with people into areas that we know a lot about and try to keep them there. And if you go over there, we'll give subtle little uh, hints and try to just shut that down in order to try and bring it back into an area that we're more comfortable and confident. Can you just stay here where I understand things? Accommodation is being happy to go over there and to learn and ask questions and engage in someone else's life. However, accommodation participates without conforming. That means I'm happy to go over there and do what you're doing and talk about what you're talking about, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to become a different person. It doesn't threaten me and who I am and how I'm called to involve myself in your life. Notice that John is incredibly accommodating. Bending himself, coming out of his wilderness and his weirdness to engage with people so long as they know that his accommodation of their place is not a hint that he is conforming. And he speaks that plainly to them. Are you an accommodating person? Called people accommodate freely because you don't threaten me. Driven people are scared to death that you might know something more and threaten my superiority. I've got to be a master of my drivenness or else I question my identity and my purpose. I'm not driven enough. That's drivenness. But if I'm called, you can't threaten my calledness. Maybe you're called the same way and then we can help each other. And so if you're threatened by someone else who knows a lot, I would challenge you to go into your calledness. Who are you? Are you called or are you driven? John's not threatened at all. He's weird. Can you accommodate without conforming? I'm going to make one more point. I'm going to ask the band to come. We're going to close out here after this one point. I want you to look at the summary of his sermon. Surely he said more than this, but look there at the end, verses 7 and 8. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. One of the questions that I like to ask, tell me your story with Jesus. I've asked many of you that question, and everyone answers differently. And some of us don't talk about Jesus. Some of us, our main character in our testimony is us. I was here, and then I did this, and I made these mistakes. Then I met Jesus, and now I do this, and I go here, and here's how my life got put back together. Who's the main character in your testimony? If I were to say, tell me your story with Jesus, would you talk more about yourself or about Jesus? Who did it? I love that about John the Baptist. He has every right to stand there and talk about what he is offering to people. And yet, instead of going into deep theological explanation of what is really happening in his baptism 
Instead of giving this big story about his parents and Zechariah and the sacrifices that were made, he didn't say anything about, you know, my parents were really old when I was born. It's a miracle that I'm even here. I'm a miracle child. And then when my father didn't give me the right name, they closed his mouth. And he finally said his name is John. And they open. he doesn't tell any of that. It is none of his backstory. He doesn't talk about his training. He doesn't talk about what it was like in the wilderness. He doesn't talk about how his baptism is going to change your life. What does he say? I am so weak. And there is someone coming who's going to outpace me by miles. You think I'm great? I can't even untie his sandals. The main character in my story is coming. That is a testimony. When we testify, church, we aren't testifying to how we got our lives turned around. We are testifying that the good news is true. And his name is Jesus. And that's what, that's what John the Baptist does. He sets us up. Jesus is everything to John, not just through John, but over John. And he has primed the pump. He has gotten us ready. Now we're on the edge of our seat. Man, the prophet said, here he comes, and there he is. He's the messenger. He's announced... Sure enough, he did come out of the wilderness. And now he's telling us what? There's someone else coming? Mark 1 continues by giving us not the birth of Jesus, but right in the beginning of his ministry. And we will find that even though the four Gospels give us large portions of the story of Jesus, Mark only has time for one year moves through very quickly. So I want us to grab a hold. It's not a bad idea for us to read through the book of Mark again and again, just cycle through it, become familiar with it. What I want us to grab a hold of, how did Jesus spend his time and am I urgent? Is there immediately in my life? Let's stand together and close in worship as we are leaving that we are greeting one another and asking names of faces we don't know.